coming up on Need to Know, Lovely Warren says she never runs from a fight. We'll hear how she plans to seek a re-election victory in a battle she anticipates will be a tough one, the battle for Rochester mayor. Also on the show, in the midst of weeks of anti-Semitic rhetoric, a Rochester woman shines a light and draws a deep connection between the Holocaust and the refugee crisis of today, and she does it through art. And our region happens to be home to some pretty brilliant young people. Don't miss the launch of our new series, Top of the Class. You'll get to meet high school seniors making a lasting imprint. Stay with us. Need to Know starts right now. There were rumblings she might make a run for Congress in 2016 by seeking the 25th Congressional District seat long held by Democrat Louise Slaughter. But for now, Mayor Lovely Warren has her eyes set on another four years as the leader of the city of Rochester. And she's got some competition. Monroe County legislator James Shepard, former television journalist Rachel Barnhart, and businessman Alex White are all vying for the job of mayor. Is the work of her current tenure enough to pull off another victory? Mayor Lovely Warren joins us now to answer that question and more and welcome back to the show it's good to see you good to see you as well thank so you let's start with the why why are you seeking another term in office as mayor I am seeking another term as in office as mayor because I believe that we are on the right track we are making progress in everything that we said we were going to do four years ago when you look at safer and more vibrant neighborhoods crime is at a 30-year low our shootings are down 22 percent we are making investments all over the city and neighborhoods that haven't seen investment in probably decades and so I think that that is very important to note when we think about education we have um, been able to enroll and increase enrollment in pre-k three and four by 1200 percent in three years and I think that that's a significant accomplishment by working with parents by working with our city school district by working with our community we've been able to do that and focus on our youngest children we think about jobs and economic development unemployment in our city has gone from nine percent down to six percent we've been able to bring Bring 22,000 jobs and you know retain 8,000 others and I think that that's progress and I think that we're going in the right direction and with the help of this community we will continue to do that. Among what you mentioned are our three issues uh, and three goals that you reference as priorities also things that you've hailed just now as areas of progress uh, bringing more jobs to the city of Rochester creating safer streets uh, and improving education. One of your opponents in the mayoral race this is legislator James Shepard recently shared this statement after three and a half years, dozens of press events, and a number of committees and panels, he says poverty levels haven't improved, police and citizen relations continue to deteriorate, violence is spiking, and our graduation rate sits at 47 percent. How would you respond to that, that statement, which really counters three areas that you say you've seen success? Well, I think that you have to look at the numbers and you have to look at um, progress where progress is, is, it has been made. Um, these aren't my numbers. These are not numbers that I pull out of the sky. Uh, these are not numbers that are done by the city of Rochester per se. These are numbers from the D Department of Labor, the numbers from the State Education Department, numbers from um, the Board of Education, numbers from our police department. And so when you look at it, you can say what you want, but the truth and the facts speak for themselves. In every area, we have made progress. And believe me, if we weren't making progress, I wouldn't be sitting in the seat running for re-election. But I believe that we are on the right path. This city has made a dramatic turnaround, a drastic turnaround. Um, when, we, when we think about where we've been and where we are today and where we need to go, we're on the right path. Um, we have been able to build off of the successes of other mayors. I've been able to draw from what Bill Johnson has done around neighborhood development, what Bob Duffy did to really um, highlight Rochester and go to you know D.C. and Albany and ask for resources and ask for dollars. Um, what Tom Richards has, you know, did when he, 
looked at our finances, we've been able to improve our city's bond rating by two bond, in, bond agencies. Two out of three have upgraded us. That's progress. When we think about the fact that we were one of four cities, one of four that was chosen by the National League of Cities out of all the cities in the country to come here and study and work with us, one of 11 cities to be in investing in manufacturing community partnership chosen by President Obama and his administration, one of 11 in the country. When we think about all these things happening, um, one of, uh, I believe, about 17 cities to be chosen um, as a Photonics Institute and have the vice president come here twice, um, Vice President Biden come here twice to really highlight mm -hmm. the great work that we're doing in our community. Now, these are not things that Lovely's talking about. Mm -hmm. These are things that the community and the nation is talking about. When you reflect on those things and, and on the past three plus years, how has your understanding or your perspective changed um, over the past few years? I'm talking about from when you first campaigned in 2013 to where you are right now. I think that I've grown in the position and you know I won't sit here and tell you that we there weren't some challenges but they were um, those challenges made us stronger they made us better and they made us uh, recognize and be able to do what we needed to do on behalf of the citizens and put the citizens first we talk about open government um, we just released last week um, a different foil request now ever since I was on City Council um, since 2007 people have been working on trying to replicate and, and make our uh, FOIL system easier for citizens. And we were able to do that. FOIL is, and, um, and is citizens <laughs> to get information about the right. workings, inner workings of city government. Absolutely, a request for information. Um, and we were able to do that, automate that system, make it easier for the citizens, make it easier for um, our employees on the inside. Plow treks, we had a major snowstorm. Um, before, for many years, we would be able to see where plows were because we had GPS. And so in 2014, when we had this major storm, and I said, well, you know, I got a, I received a number of complaints. I said, well, why can't our citizens see this? We made it possible for our citizens to be able to see where the plow is, when the last time they plowed, made sure that we were able to make sure that we were documenting and accurate with information. I mean, it's, I'm sorry to interrupt because I want to get to, and I know viewers mm -hmm. are dying to hear your plans for moving forward. And mm -hmm. I, I do want to jump on into the issue of jobs and increased employment opportunities for residents. What is your game plan for, for 2018 and moving forward? to bring jobs, more jobs to Rochester? Well, we're working with the Finger Lakes Regional Economic Development Council. Um, you see many jobs um, coming here and businesses from all over the world relocating to Rochester. And that's what we will continue to do. We will continue to introduce programs like Kiva. Everyone doesn't want to be an employee. Kiva's people, for small businesses, people absolutely. interested in starting their own small businesses. Absolutely. Ones to help them get started. Um, actually, they want to be entrepreneurs. And we were able to realize that there's a market for micro lending and we became a, a city, one of one, I think one of um, the first city in New York State to actually introduce this program. We've lent over $100,000 to micro businesses. Um, many of those businesses are women and people of color, um, able to buy equipment, mm -hmm. come outside of their car or into a, a brick and mortar um, establishment. So is That's your hope to help to expand that? Yeah, moving absolutely, forward? absolutely. We'll continue to expand that. We'll continue to work to bring um, more businesses here to expand the businesses that we have. We have great businesses here in Rochester that want to grow. We're training people through our YAMTEP program, Young Adults Manufacturing Training Employment Program, our OTR program, training people so that they can get into these jobs that we, uh, that we have here so that businesses can expand. Let's talk education, because I know this was something that was huge uh, in terms of your campaign platform in 2013. You had you unveiled even a seven-point uh, Warren education plan. So talk to me. You said that you would be bringing new schools and new approaches we've never seen before. What are they? Did any not materialize the way that you wanted and you plan to work on moving forward? Actually, we were able to sell two previous city school buildings to two charter schools, and so we expanded the charter schools here. We were able to really focus on pre-K. Um, we had a three-to-three -three initiative, and in that was focusing on pre-K. We en um, enrolled, um, increased enrollment in preschool education by 1,200%. When we talk about opening up City Hall to internships, we actually um, every year have increased our internships at City Hall. We have a number of those college students that have gone on to do great things. Some of them remained in the city 
of Rochester working for us or working for um, other people that, um, th that our training was uh, able to allow them to do. We've been working with the city school district to um, really focus on what we need to do around career technical education to give our children a fighting chance at life and we'll continue to do those things. We have made progress along the way. Is there anything that did not, I, mean, I know one big thing was to get teachers, to draw in more teachers to the city of Rochester. You said exceptional teachers. How did that go? Well, we are in the process. I just had a meeting with the deputy superintendent. We had changes at the school district. We talked to uh, Teach for America, and um, you know, one of the things that we had charter schools that was open to it. You know, the city school district at the time was not necessarily um, open to it. But I think that I, I just talked to the deputy superintendent. Have a meeting with the superintendent on Monday, and I believe that uh, they are on the right track to really go after and attract additional teachers visiting HBCUs and other schools that they haven't visited yeah. before. And and I think that that's very important and we're working together to do that. Very good. All right, well, as viewers know, we've been inviting all candidates in the 2017 mayoral race to join me right here at the table. So it's great to have you here. I appreciate your time. Uh, Alex White will join me on next week's program and I'll be asking all of you hopefully to join me together in the near future to answer questions from you, the viewers, and to further lay out your game plan for the city of Rochester moving forward. So to learn more about the reelection campaign of Mayor Lovely Warren, go to MayorLovelyWarren.com. For years, my next guest wanted to find a way to tell her parents' story, and she did on a theatrical stage. It's a story of one of the darkest times in world history. It's a story of the implications of displacement for those facing persecution during the Holocaust. It's a story of the power of a fighting spirit. And as the co-creator and producer of the musical Moses Man explains, it's also a story that connects to our nation's current political climate from anti-Semitic hatred to the refugee crisis. So what was once a personal story is now one that this Rochester resident wants to personalize for everyone. And she's doing it through a week-long multi-arts event. Joining me now to share more is the brainchild behind this special event, Deborah Haver. And it is so great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So Debbie, as I mentioned, you're the brainchild of this extremely timely event as well, I should say. And I want, just before we kind of dig into it, explain a little bit about the concept behind Finding Home Shine the Light. Well, as you mentioned, the start of this whole event began with um, Moses Mann, the musical. About four years ago, my partner Casey Filiacci and I created um, a musical to discuss and to bring to a universal audience my parents' story. And so we started out there, and as you mentioned, it's kind of a, has, has become a broader uh, project and encompassing a lot of uh, different aspects of art and how art uh, can affect and uh, uh, change people because it is dealing with emotion typically you know you you see a piece of art and it can change you in some fashion hopefully it does and so um, as we were thinking about uh, shifting and transitioning Moses man to incorporate uh, different situations that are right. happening in the world today. Um, I reached out uh, first to the university, and uh, Indiana University, and um, so we decided to have a symposium, Art and Refugees. And so what, as that was developing, excuse me, as that was developing, um, I wanted to bring it home because that is where Moses Mann started. And so uh, what happened is, is that uh, I reached out to other artists, um, to a photographer, to a glass artist, and seeing what their vision and their experiences were with the past, the glass show is actually a little bit about the past, and the photography show is current, what is going on in the world today, and how that both relates to what I'm doing with a musical and bringing it out as a, a, a topic and an experience for our community for discussion, for opening eyes a little bit, for just understanding. A lot of this has to do really with the human compassion and that's really the basis of this this project. Well, let's take a look. We've got a short video clip and you will be doing a theatrical presentation mm -hmm. of Moses Man and I want to just to give viewers uh, a little bit of a taste of what they can expect. So we'll take a look. Okay. Moses Man Finding Home. A true story of hope and courage. A journey of survival through impossible obstacles to find home and freedom during one of history's darkest times. Finding Home, a true story of then, a journey of now. 
Join the journey to shine a new light, a journey of then through a gateway to now, of hope and survival, of understanding and compassion. Debbie, what did you learn from your parents' story that you want audiences to reflect on when it comes to our past, when we think of the Holocaust, uh, and also when it comes to our current political climate? Well, my family story and why we del delved into it, um, and it was, a, as of now, four-year journey from the beginning to where we are right now. And in the beginning, it was really a Holocaust. You know, it was all about in, uh, the experience of the whole. And then we really looked at what my parents' story was, which was a, a, a journey of courage, of survival, of getting through where those obstacles were, how to get through, how to, how to, to find home, essentially, because their journey was one of nine years. They were displaced for nine years, and they traveled from uh, Austria to Italy to Cyprus to Palestine at the time, and then in Africa for five years before coming to the United States. And they almost didn't make it many times. And actually, at the very, very last moment of coming to this country, my father was barred to get on that last boat because of the quotas that were in place. So fortunately, it changed. There was some emergency action on their part, and they were labeled displaced people as opposed to um, refugees. And that made their difference in coming to the country. So all of this was going on as we were developing, and we're uh, seeing what's happening to the unfortunate people who are displaced right now in the world, and that's where it was. That's, so that's where what I, I want from. to talk about. You've, yep. you've drawn this connection between your parents' journey during the Holocaust um, and, and the millions, to the millions of displaced refugees today. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, you've referenced Syrian refugees. Explain just a little bit, so because some viewers may not understand. Explain the relevance of that connection. Okay. Well, I'm just going to give you an example. Yeah. Okay. Um, my parents had a lot of difficulty getting on boats, getting off of boats, being on crowded boats, being um, in places where it was incredibly dangerous. Uh, for instance, the boat going from Cyprus to Palestine was bombed. It was it, uh, not not the boat itself, but surrounding the boat. There were torpedoes, there were submarines, there were all these dangers. Basically, it's a danger. And so we look at those photos, we see the photos of today, we see these crowded, crowded boats that are being shot, that are being um, uh, attacked, and where do they go? And that is really the essence. It's like, there's despair, there's where's the respite, where's home? And that's the center, and that's really the correlation. Um, it's interesting because you mentioned about the, the presentation that I'll be doing, and I, I do want to say that it, what it is is as an explanation multimedia with narrative, with live actors, um, and some of the things that we will be uh, expressing is testimony from then and testimony from now. And it's really interesting to see the correlation, and that's what we want to project on this week-long event in Rochester. So you, as you mentioned this, you'll be featuring a fine art glass exhibition, yes. and in addition to a photo exhibit by an international photographer. Yes. What is it about their work uh, that speaks to you? Because you've, you have this mission, and you said to me last week, you just want to get people talking and to put a human face to this issue. Absolutely. So I'll talk a little bit about, um, first, the photography, and then I'm going to go back to the glass. Um, so the photographer, uh, Charlotte Schmitz, is from uh, Germany, and I found her through a CNN story, actually. And she uh, did photo expose, ex I, I think that's what, how you say that, um, uh, of the refugees in the camps and allowed them to write on those photographs their feelings at that moment. Mm -hmm. So it's like capturing a moment in time for these people and it's real and it's then and it's now. And it's portraying that to us. And so when you see these photos, they are very, very strong. And very simple, but it really gets you in your heart for sure. The glass exhibition, now this is the current, we go back now. Mm -hmm. How does that relate? Um, the glass exhibition, there's some amazing glass works from international artists, and, and that's fantastic. It's centered around the feature glass piece, which is called Totus Marcha uh, Revisited. That is the death march. And so this artist, Laura Donifer, 
drew from her experience, from her father's experience of the death marches from, he's also a Holocaust survivor, and it was her expression of people being displaced, persecuted, and unfortunately uh, perished, so, and displaced. So, so that is really the correlation between the two exhibitions. Well, I know that this, this is something that it's here in Rochester. It will be traveling to Indiana and, and beyond. Uh, and we want to thank you for joining us. Thank you so uh, and much. Thank you so much for bringing this work, not only here locally to your home, but also to around the country. So the week-long multi-arts event, Finding Home, Shine the Light, starts Thursday, March 23rd, and runs through Saturday, April 1st at the Lewis S. Walk JCC of Greater Rochester and Nazareth College. All the details are posted online at deeparts.org. I'm excited to announce a new series that kicks off today on Need to Know. News coverage, including the youth voice, gauging the youth perspective, and digging into issues affecting our youth are of importance to WXXI and to this program. Part of that coverage also means finding and reaching out to young people, in this case high school seniors, who are not only working hard to make the grade in school, but also want to make our community and our world a better place. Need to Know's Top of the Class series introduces you to these amazing young people. First up in the series, Greece Athena Senior, Chima Dimba. He asked me a question first and I'll come right back, okay? You could yeah. interview anyone in the school and they would speak highly of Chima. She's just someone you want to respect because she's such a great person. And add back the 35% on to 6370 yeah. to get your original price to your total. <laughs> okay? Not only does she help other people, but she influences them to want to be better, to help them. Like, that's a role model I want to uh, strive to be like. Sorry. Okay. Chima is one of these kids that she's a quiet leader. She leads by example. She never brags, she's not boastful, anything like that. Doesn't rest on her accomplishments or say, look at me and what I've done. Uh, she goes out there and is the first one to practice, last one to leave, one of those uh, type of kids. Last season was the first season starting with hurdles and she helped me with like my form and my starts. She always tells me, like, be humble, have sportsmanship. Even if someone beats you, like, you have to be humble. You have to clap for them, say congratulations. When you see her, the amount of effort that she puts into the things you do, it makes you want to do that as well, because you want to rise to the level that she puts in. So how do you find tax off the cost? I think she could take her skills and her drive to actually put it to work in some other place, not just her own little sphere, but the whole world. Kind of makes sense. Yeah. Grace Athena High School senior Chima Dimba joins us now and welcome to the show. It's Thank great to you. see you again. Good to see you too. So Chima, when we launched this series, we really wanted to make a concerted effort to learn about what matters to young people in our community in addition to highlighting the work that you're doing. And when you watch the news and you hear about issues going on in our community, what would you say are some of the things that are of most importance to you? I think having the opportunity to, for everyone's opinion to be heard, then evaluating the truth behind that opinion. Um, I believe that everyone has a right to be understood, no matter where they come from, and that it's important to look back and see where they're coming from and why they're coming from that point. I think some of what we saw from your friend Amy yes. kind of coincides with what you just said and yes. it's that you make people feel comfortable and that you listen and that you lead by example um, and it was really great just to be at your school and to hear people um, talk about you and the great things that you're doing and I want to know what drives you because clearly you're an exceptional student. I should point out you have a 4.3 GPA <laughs> but you, as you said you have interests and cares outside of this world too. I mean outside of just academic work but with the world as well. What is it that makes you push and and to excel? I think I've always been internally motivated and my dad came here from Nigeria and so he came as an immigrant, he had nothing, he worked his way up and so I'm always, that's like my model and so I'm always trying to work better and better myself with all the resources that I have but at the same time I still want to show, you know, I'm not trying to be a star, I just want to help other people become like what I've become and become better than me. 
So when I scheduled with your principal time to come and see you and film, it was a little difficult because you have a busier schedule than I do. <laughs> and I found out after the fact, part of that is because you're a, a participant in a program called New Vision. Yes. Explain that so viewers know what it is and what you're doing. Right. So twice a week I go to Strong Hospital, and right now I'm on the heart transplant unit. So I shadow nurses on that floor. And so I would go to school on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And I go to math and gym, and then I go to... I'm Renew Community Hospital, and I learn English and economics on the days I don't go to the Strong Hospital. And so it's everything's based around health, because yeah. I want to go into health professions, I want to be a doctor someday. So it's really a great opportunity to see what's really going on and having a hands-on learning experience. This is a, a, a year-long and intense yes. academic program that you're involved with. Yes. Uh, and talk a little bit about what drew you to the field of healthcare. Why do you want to practice medicine? I just want to help people. I love being hands-on. I love talking to people. I love interacting with people. I want to see people become better and grow. And so like, if I have an opportunity to really help someone out and I really want to help them in the health unit, healthcare, you know, because that could change their entire life. Well, one thing that I should mention, you are, you're quite the athlete, uh, and you have a particular love for track, uh, indoor, cross country, outdoor, you're yes. also a basketball star. Mm -hmm. How competitive are you when it comes to sports? Because I know we heard you say, you know, you told one young lady, listen, it's good to be humble, but right. do you think that, you know, that it's good to have some friendly competition? Yes, I definitely would love, <laughs> I love winning, and I love being competitive. Um, growing up, I always played with my brother and my sister outside, and I love winning and being competitive, and it's just... I, it's the feeling going on the podium after all the hard work pays off, it, nothing can beat that. What is it you love about running? Because that is really your, when we yes. were communicating, you were heading to Long Island or, you know, yes. for, a, for a track meet. Why do you love it? I love the feeling afterwards. You feel, I feel so good after I run and it just feels so exhilarating to run and then compete and think that you did it all by yourself in individual sport. So all the work that you put in pays off and that you can see that your improvement because you put all that work in. And if you don't put the work in, you won't see the results. So it's always, I just love, you know, jump, running through the hurdles and going over the finish line and turn around and seeing the scoreboard and being like, that was all me. So I, I know we, viewers may be wondering, so where is she heading for college? We've got about 30 seconds left. Any ideas? Have you selected a school? Can you give us a few names? I have not selected a school yet. I've been accepted to every single school I've applied so far. So that's very exciting. I will decide by the end of this month and beginning of April. Very good. We are out of time, but a special thank you to my guests and the first student in Need to Know's Top of the Class series, Chima Dimba. We look forward to seeing and hearing about all the great things that you'll continue to do in our society. Thank you for being thank such you. a stellar role model. And before we close tonight, we want to honor and remember a member of the WXXI family, veteran radio talk show host Bob Smith, the much loved and respected voice and talent behind WXXI Radio's 1370 Connections died on Friday, March 17th. Bob suffered a massive stroke in April 2013, ending his decades long radio career. He was brilliant and kind and he is dearly missed. Thank you for joining us tonight here on Need to Know, Rochester's News Magazine. I'm your host, Helen B. and Duty Hofer. I will see you next week.